I do believe stories make the world not atoms. Give me a Seinfeld inspired product or a brand. I'll go home a happy man. <laughs> At the heart of it it is about understanding that human, right? All people who are unhappy with work, I'm sorry to say politically very incorrect, their parents are to blame. Oh wow. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jay Kumar Hariyaran. I'm an executive coach, author and speaker. Stories that shift is a series of intimate and up-close conversations with CXOs and practitioners of various disciplines about what makes them tick. Stories are not what you say. Stories are who we are. I have a very interesting guest on my show today, uh Anju Joseph, partner India head of Quantum Consumer Solutions. Anju welcome to the show. Thank you Jay it's my pleasure. Awesome. Um so just to give some context to people who are tuning in uh can you talk us through what are the service offerings that Quantum has in the country and in other parts of the world? Right. So uh just to give you a little bit of background because you know we are we are a small company uh-huh. and probably the world's best kept secret. So while our clients know us I'm not sure like we are you know we are famous uh like a uh, unilever sure, or a, sure uh, you know or a marico or whatever uh so we are we are a company that's been in existence for over 32 years mm-hmm. we were born in 1990 and we like to call ourselves an indian mnc because while we started in india now we are mm-hmm. across the globe uh we have offices in london we have offices in shanghai in singapore you know in other other parts of uh, southeast asia we also have offices in bangladesh sri lanka so uh, and we have three offices in india so we become pretty big uh, now and we have a global footprint and um, so in terms of like what we do yeah. fundamentally the the reason why this company started was um, actually to take the discipline of qualitative research which is which is really to say understanding the human to solve complex problems that discipline and give it its due was the reason why this company started and i think we've we've uh, you know we've uh, been true to that of course we've grown we've developed we've added other arsenal uh, you know to what we offer however fundamentally this company is about putting the human at the center to be able to solve problems that matter to our clients that matter to the planet that matter to our consumers right who are human beings first before being consumers and our clients are also human beings first before being Absolutely. consumers so really that's in a nutshell that's what we do and uh, in terms of like what we offer we do a lot of work in the area of brand strategy we do a lot of work in the area of innovation in terms of we are now entering into service design product design uh, we also have a dedicated sustainability practice so broadly i think that's that's what we offer to our clients amazing uh which would be the bulk of your service offering brand strategy brand strategy yes um in your experience of what about 25 years with quantum um i'm sure there have been like numerous successes numerous wonderful work that you've done uh can you walk us through a couple of them that you're really proud of that was like wow we actually did that you know uh-huh. It's like uh it's like choosing Choose your baby. favorite child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like choosing your favorite child, but I think uh, so so one of the one of the things that we have is like all the data that we have or all our learning is client confidential. So I'm going to be talking I'll t- yeah. talk you about things that are in the public domain and either therefore, that either that or yeah. you can just say, you know, category X and there was a brand. Yeah. And this is what we kind of did. I yeah. mean completely up to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So maybe I'll choose the latter, sure. right? Like which sure. is sure. which is to say I'll talk about brands and I'll talk about very interesting things that we Lovely. did and uh, so so I want to talk about this brand called Titan Raga. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh early on uh it was not really such a big brand, mm-hmm. right? Like it was a tiny little brand. In fact, uh the women's watch market in India itself was like very very small. So what did you what did a woman's watch look like? It was a miniature of a men's watch, mm. right? That's what it looked like. And uh, Titan called us with this very interesting brief uh, to say that you know, we want Raga to be the jewel in Titan's crown, mm. right? And the 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 vision obviously their their vision is always big and you know things that we can't think about. Uh the the vision was really to make it a very important part of titan one of the things that they told us was uh, that you know uh, 
very few women are buying it. However, whoever buys it loves it, right? So we said, uh, and they said, like now we need to like really explore the market. So what did we do? We said, if there is deep love for the brand, let's go the archetypal route, right? Mm-hmm. Let's identify what is the archetype of mm-hmm. Raga, mm-hmm. right? And so, uh, so we we have a toolkit which uh, sort of delves into the unconscious, the psyche, and um, what we found really was that Titan Raga was the lover. So, mm. so women in India, homemakers then, uh, I mean, this was in 2004, 2005. Uh, what they told us was, you know, uh, look at my life, right? Like I have, it's so busy. Uh, you know, my husband is, you know, he comes back home. He's busy with the TV. He's busy with, uh, you know, his newspaper. You know, he's just there. Like there are very few avenues for me to feel feminine, right? But when I wear a raga, I just feel like I'm the most beautiful. You know, I, it. So what the what the women said was, it makes me more of the woman that I am, right? And that we thought was really, really powerful. And we went back to Titan and we told them like this this amazing thing. And of course, like you know, there was disbelief, right? Like how can something on a wrist be a lover and so on? However, I think I mean they're the probably the most astute marketers in the oh, country. Oh, hundred percent. And so they took it forward and they launched the uh, Rani Mukherjee communication, which. I don't know if you recall, but it was quite iconic Mm -hmm. where she takes off all pieces of jewelry and uh, she wears a raga and it talks about how this is a really beautiful relationship. And it was very sensual with uh, like the then marketing head Suparna. She said uh, with a hint of a man, right? So there is no man in the communication, but there was a hint of a man. So it was, it was really sensual. It was really beautiful. And the brand grew 10 times in a year. Right. And, um, and the best thing was, again, the uh, Suparna uh, told me that a consumer called her and said, how did you know what I was feeling? Oh, you know, and that, uh, in fact, like when she told me that, I said, your, your, your life as a marketeer is done. Right. Like, because how 100%. many marketeers can hear something like this? So I think that's a, that's a favorite example. Right. Like, because, uh, I feel like while it, while it served the marketing objective, it also played a very big role in the woman's life. It made her feel so beautiful. It made her feel, um, you know, lovely, right? Loved. And it also, therefore, redefined her environment for her, right? Like the, the environment became beautiful. Uh, how she looked became beautiful. Every Relationships around her became beautiful. And so I think that's, a, that's really like a really amazing example. And then what, what Titan has done with it is has taken the archetype of the lover, but has been able to constantly redefine it to the times, right? Like, so today their communication is uh, flaunt your flaws. And uh, the uh, and that's the highest level of the lover archetype, which is to say that to love yourself Absolutely. is the highest level of Absolutely. the archetype, right? So I think I think that's a that's an incredible example to me. The other one, uh, again, like way back, uh, I know, like you know, when you're 25 years in a company, you have examples from then, and probably with age. You know, recent memory also goes away, right? Like it's, You're absolutely it's, right. It's what you've you done know, in the past. The past is tinged with yes. a lot of nostalgia. That's true. So quality walls, right? Like so it was, it came to India with great pomp and show, but it was not really seeing, you know, it was not seeing fruits of its success. So the, the, the question became at one point, should we exit India? Mm. And uh, they came to us and they said that like, you know, there are all these other brands and we don't know if, you know, we should be... Uh, we should be in India. So let's do what we call an equity study, right? Mm -hmm. Like an equity is the health of a brand vis-a-vis competition at a given point in time. It is our largest selling product uh, and clients swear by it. All clients do it, you know, regularly two or three years later. I mean, depending on the industry they're in. So we we did uh, an equity study where we compared it with Amul and, you know, the rest of it. And one of the techniques we used was to ask consumers to pull out images that, you know, represented walls to them, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And versus an Amul. And and when we looked at the images, the Amul images were all about family and, yeah. you know, celebration and all of that. But the quality walls images were all about sensuality, right? Like they were all about, you know, because quality walls offered like this really multi-sensorial experience, sure. multi-textural. It, you know, it did things in your mouth. It, uh, you know, made you feel a certain way. There was uh, auditory uh, you know, very many auditory sounds that you heard when you consumed the walls. So basically what we found was that the brand was not being true 
to how the consumer is experiencing it. And then they launched this communication called Pleasure Up. Mm. And I just want to say they're still in the market, right? Like so, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, and, and, and there are many more examples like that. But I think these two work. Do they work? 200%. <laughs> I mean, um, so on, on a side note, my wife uh, is a satisfied consumer of Raga. I mean, ah, okay. I, you know, at least yeah. at that point when it launched. And, uh, and I completely uh, think and admire Titan as one of the most astute customer understanding brands in the country today. Yes. And uh, progressive images of a newer India, of a newer consumer, always a step ahead of the next category. Huge respect for uh, what Titan has done. And, you know, with with agencies like yours and, you know, uh, figuring out the psyche of the consumer is such an important part in for them to help figure out what their communication has to be. And, you know, in some cases, go back and rework the product uh, if that's necessary, right? Um, amazing. So, can I come in here? So, sure. it's not just communication, right? It's like not. so. So, if you're the so Titan Raga, then also had a workwear line which was called Nine to Five, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. it was about mm-hmm. sharp edges and you know, like efficiency yeah. and yeah. all of that. It didn't fit with the lover code. So, what what Raga did was actually the lover was manifest in all elements of the mix. So the products, they did away with the 9 to 5 range, mm. right? All their products are, you'll see they're, they're, they're beautiful, right? Like, but they don't have edges. They're like, um, yeah, it's, it's, you it's, know, it's, yeah, correct. And, and they draw from beautiful things in nature or chocolate or, you know, even their collections are very, very beautifully named. So even the if you look at their packaging is really very beautiful, very feminine. Was so, there a lot of, sorry, I mean, this is just a thought that sprung in my head. Was there a lot of Indian ethos? Oh, yes. uh, also connected to this oh, yes, from a absolutely. central point of view absolutely. and doesn't have to be necessarily, uh, you know, Western classical music like the sonata that plays for Titan and, you know, so on. It was very, very Indian. It yes. was very central from an Indian woman's perspective. Absolutely. I think that was beautiful. No, absolutely. You know, uh, but I think like, I think what, uh, to, to your point that they're always ahead of the consumer, mm-hmm, Titan, mm-hmm. Uh, I just think that they respect the consumer. Wow. Right. And, and I think that's the fundamental difference because uh, and, and not to say all my clients respect uh, their consumers, but sometimes you hear clients say, who is this animal? You know, I don't get this, this animal. Mm. Or, you know, you look at a consumer who's using your brand and you say, oh, no, 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 this is not my consumer. Mm. Titan will never do that. They'll never diss their consumer. Right. And they in fact, they believe that they have to embrace the the person who's buying you to be able to do full justice to the brand. So I think that again makes them, uh, you know, they're distinguished in that sense. Which actually leads me to a little bit of a conundrum. And let me let me throw it out to you for some clarification. So uh, it's it's not a binary conversation, but there are views on opposing ends. One is by Steve Jobs saying that the customer doesn't really know what he what he or she wants. It's my job as a brand marketer, as a product person, to take the person there and show him this is what the future looks like. Um, or Henry Ford, if he had done market research at that point in time and asked what would you want, maybe people would have said I want fa- faster horse carriages. And for them to take the tectonic uh, shift, sometimes a marketer has to rely on saying, no, 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 listen, I'm going to take an intuitive leap and I'm going to go there. And on the other hand, you have David Ogilvy, the consumer is not a moron, she is your wife. So you can see how both these play out uh, on both sides of the coin, if if I were to phrase it that way. Where does one stop and where does the other begin? You know, I don't think they oppo- they are in opposition. All right. Right. I feel like that's why questions become so important, right? Mm. Like, so what are you looking to do? There is you, no brand can create meaning for the consumer. What brands can do is articulate the meaning that she's seeking in her life. Sure. Right. Brands are not gods. Of course. Right. Like, yeah. so, so what they can do is they can enable the consumer in her journey of meaning making. However, how that gets manifest, she can't. Right. Like, so she cannot tell you that I want an iPhone. Mm. She cannot tell you that. Mm. Right. So to ask that question to her is, is not fair. However, does she want beauty in her life? Mm. Does she want to stand apart in her life? Does she want to get, does she, when I should say she, I mean, she, he, uh, or any other gender, uh, do they want to get from point A to point B in greater comfort? Of course they do. 
right and so so if steve jobs had just randomly made something uh, you know which had no meaning then it wouldn't have worked of course not right so i think there is meaning and there's manifestation when he talks of manifestation i fully agree however without meaning it cannot be a success mm. you know and and that's why i think uh, we i mean they are very articulate and uh, you know of all of them are very articulate make impactful statements but i i do think that we need to be careful about what they actually say because i think uh, like i've read a lot about uh, steve jobs and i do know that he was very invested in understanding what does it mean for the consumer he was very in- invested he he actually lived in india you know he's very in tune with hinduism yeah, yeah. spirituality yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. these are all deep sciences right yeah, like so yeah. so to you know to say it's not a binary is basically what i'm saying or yeah. on on two sides of the same continuum yeah, absolutely. right and there will come a time in every marketer's life and i hope it happens more often than not when consumer speak says this his heart says that and to balance the duality of thought without dismissing either one of that I think it's a beautiful trade for a marketer, right? Of course. Dude. I mean, that's what differentiates them. Mm. You know, people who can uh who hear what people say mm. and who understand what they mean. I think that's the fundamental distinction between successful marketers and uh you know, the also runs. Amazing. I think uh if we are going to focus only on marketing and branding I think we can speak for the rest of the day I agree <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even longer even you know longer. yeah <laughs> uh but coming back to stories and uh what leaders can uh take away my own trust with uh because I come from a sales advertising sales marketing brand kind of a background um I was really fascinated between um the intersection between executive coaching and branding and i managed to uh, i i wrote a column which ruffled many feathers within the executive coaching community when i compared uh, you know what the basic fundamental principles of behavioral change are rooted in the jungian archetype which advertising borrows very very freely from why shouldn't executive coaching do that and i went on to say you know disclaimers there are differences the differences being here branding stroke advertising marketing you know i'm just clubbing it all together as a persuasive science uh uses these elements to nudge somebody else's behavior to benefit the brand in question but imagine if you were the consumer yourself and you were to go through all those elements to draw and drive behavioral change for yourself as in you know create an advertising campaign for yourself create those meaningful nudges for yourself figure out the meaning behind the behavioral change that you're seeking um which i thought was a was was an interesting um coming of age in my head about combining two disparate extremely disparate disciplines uh, into one cohesive thought process your thoughts yeah no i i i agree in fact innovation comes like that right mm-hmm. there are no new ideas yeah there are new combinations of yeah. ideas right like so so like for instance uh, something of interest to me now is biomimicry right like why aren't we why aren't we studying uh, you know natural systems yeah. to say how, what can brands borrow from there right like what can uh, products borrow from there or um, actually um, okay i'm very bad with names but darkner kelter i think has mm-hmm. done work on the science of all where uh, what he's done now is he's all the philosophies whatever they spoke of he's identified the biological and neural manifestations of them right so he's actually discovered a nerve that he calls the vagus nerve vagus, yeah, yeah yeah which is uh, you know which is the the happy nerve yeah, the yeah, yeah. and uh, to me all of that is so it is so amazing right like so he's he's taken spirituality and he's married it with biology or biomimicry that uh, you know there's enough work in the world of design that borrows from natural systems sure. you know that are that sure. are out there sure. so i think that's that is the idea of innovation so i think i think that's great that's how the world moves forward <laughs> I think did he also posit that uh, or it was it somewhere else that I read that for you to be innovative spend time on or inspiring art or nature draw from that as much as you can draw uh not just from rejuvenation but also from a clinical understanding of what makes me go wow I'm just so this is so majestic and uh any any thoughts on that oh yes in fact like what he talks about is what he calls he says everybody should go on or walks 
right? Like, so you you walk around and you look at things and uh, make them creator, right? Like we we take everything, like we yeah. we look at everything yeah. and we it's just glossed over, yeah. right? Like because we're so busy in our own heads. And however, if you go out and try to look for beauty, right? And if you try to look for awe, it uh, it is uh, it is a great way to put you in a positive frame of mind. It is a great way to make you look at the world very differently. So yeah, he's um, bang on. Yeah, <laughs> nice. And, but also the the, the nudge is there is beauty in the commonplace. Yes, which one would otherwise miss if you're not wearing the lens. And the intentionality that I'm going to seek or in most things that I observe in my day-to-day environment. You know, just to build on that, yeah. uh, there's this stand-up comic, very famous, uh, George Carlin, uh, yeah, yeah, who, yeah. who's no of more. Uh, he introduced this term called Vuja Day. Mm-hmm. So it is the opposite of Deja Vu, right? Like, And what he said was to find the unfamiliar in the familiar. Right, like so. So, for instance, he talks about the black box mm-hmm, in an aircraft, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. he says, if the entire aircraft gets destroyed, how come this black box does not? Right, like, like what's going on? Right, like so. But nobody's asked this question. <laughs> right, like so. So he's like that. But if you think about it, Netflix did exactly that, hmm. or Airbnb, hmm. or Uber. Uber, somebody standing at a signal and saying, okay, there's so many cars going, but there's only one person now. The familiar, which could be completely ignored, deja vu, but he he reversed it, right? Like so, vuja day as a as an idea of thinking, I think is a is a very very powerful one. Just make my day and give me a Seinfeld inspired product or a brand. <laughs> I'll go home a happy man. <laughs> because his take on uh, regular day-to-day occurrences and uh, finding the unfamiliar or the weird or yes, the strange. Yes. It's, and I, I must have watched, uh, you know, countless reruns of all his uh, episodes. And I'm wondering, why didn't I think about it? Oh, why did I gloss over that? Or that ha- that, that happened to me. Yes. So uh, a, a side story is... Um, uh, uh, Jason Alexander, who plays uh, George Costanza, and he said, "Who does this? This doesn't. Nobody does this." And uh, Larry David, who's the creator, along with uh, Jerry, I am that person. This happened to me. I did it. <laughs> 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 so apparently, the entire show is uh, dedicated to Larry not being able to act, and he's saying, "Okay, you're my Larry. You will embody <laughs> everything that I want to communicate to the world." And Jason Alexander, of course, brilliant, brilliant uh, guy, uh, did an amazing thing. But I think observation, I mean, if uh, somebody who's tuning in, if uh, if there's a CXO who wants to really take something back for his leadership practice from what you do, what would that be? From what I do? Yeah. I think, as, as, uh, well, uh, see the work that I do contributes to bottom line right like so that's the that's the first probably very basic very business uh, link we right? will like, get into that in a little bit with right. greater gusto yeah <laughs> but uh, you know from what i do i think i think like uh, all aspects of our life we deal with humans mm-hmm. right so be it, uh, you know be it your family be it uh, you know people you work with be it your clients be it your consumers at the end of the day you're dealing with human beings and the ability to understand human beings at a level at a visceral level right at a level which is deeper than you know what somebody's saying uh, i think is a superpower mm-hmm. right and and therefore um uh, I think that's the that's the fundamental gift wow that's that deep. Uh, you know that that uh, that my my company helps marketers. At the heart of it, that's what it is. At the heart of it, it is about understanding that human, right? And to be able to solve their needs in the best possible way. Right, so like I like I said, Raga could could think of itself as a watch, mm. but when you think of it as a lover, you are mm. actually creating meaning for the consumer. Sure. You you know, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Or Nike. Nike could think of itself as a pair of shoes, but it evokes the hero in you. Mm. You know, and and that's how you make meaning. Right and and like we are we are interpreter interpreter interpreters of you know the human condition for our clients right so I think I think that's fundamental then I think the other thing that we can, we uh, they can borrow from us is that anything that happens uh, there are three levels right like so the first level is information yeah the the second level is how you interpret it 
but the third level is insight mm. right like an insight is really what is the power it has to unlock an opportunity and again um you know like for instance let's take the example of dove like a beautiful brand yeah. very very powerful uh, and I, i to me as an archetype uh, as a mother i think Or it's, the, it, it's uh, the innocent it's innocent yeah so uh, if if you if you look at uh, if you look at dove right like the information for uh, the, you know it's probably the the singular brand that has had two epiphanies in its life right, right. like so the first one was um, you know consumer said soaps dry skin mm. right and uh, dove came up with one fourth moisturizing milk and i think that was an insight right like sure. because sure. what it helped do was solve like a big problem and the second epiphany was this idea of real beauty where you found that like 92% women actually feel very very inadequate basis the advertising yeah. right so so again you had information which is that uh, you know women buy want to be beautiful which is probably the information the interpretation is that but they don't feel very beautiful the third level is how do i translate that how do i turn it on its head to be able to create a new narrative for that woman right like which is which is the idea of real beauty so and the power lies in that that third space completely you know completely. and and yeah so i think that's that's what we do in partnership and not to say we do it on on our own and uh, it's not without the clients uh, we work with the finest marketing minds and uh, you know this is what we do in collaboration with them i think uh, what we spoke about was really um, meaningful and i hope many leaders who you know who are tuning in will understand that while it's glib to say that we are all about people and you hear many organizations saying that you know we are all about people but i've started questioning that thought a little bit now with the advent of tech uh there have been lot of uh, organizations where toe treading is fashionable uh, is encouraged dissent is encouraged disagreeableness is encouraged um a tribal feudal mentality kind of a thing but it's brilliant tech right so somewhere along the line that is something that uh, is is a is a little jarring even for me for organizations to say something and not mean it uh, as against you know this this entire trope of uh, you know we are a family and some other organizations say no we're not a family we're a professionally run organization i understand we get our whole selves to work uh any place that denies us that share is not a great place to work i completely get that again coming back to the ends of the continuum different ways of thinking kind of a thing um and i'm rambling and i've completely forgotten my point <laughs> please edit this <laughs> all right um okay so that, that that was just like a take right um what what is that will just get into um what has been your personal life story how did you come about this as a practice and i'm i'm also interested in what has gone into the making of who you are today right uh i think that's a that's a very good question with i'm not sure the answer is very long mm -hmm. i am uh my father was in the army uh -huh. and i think my upbringing as a result has been very very different so i have moved 11 schools uh i have lived in uh more places than anybody would know sure. i have changed schools in the same year oh, you know okay. and um, and as a result i've lived in very different cultures right so you go to the north you go to the northeast you go to the east uh, is very different from sure. the the west and sure. the and the south and i belong to kerala so it's been it's been like um, it's been quite interesting like that right like so adaptability i think is something that i've it's it's i'm wired like that because that's the only option right in 9 months you move schools you go to a new school which means everybody's friends there you have to make new friends you have to impress the teachers you have to you know yeah. uh, catch up with the you know what has been taught you have to learn what you've you've missed in your earlier school and so on right like so um yeah so i've moved around a lot and so adaptability tolerance to ambiguity mm. have been uh, have been part of my life right and and therefore the the um uh, therefore the uh, i think uh, you know when i when i read uh, when i think about when i introspect i think that uh, i 
my coping strategy, which is actually holding me in very good stead today, is that I don't start things with, am I interested or not? So I wow. start things with, I must be interested in what I do. Right, because I think it it removes a lot of unhappiness. Jeez. Right, so so if I am, uh, see, I'm a researcher, mm-hmm, right? Like mm-hmm. I I have lived my life as a researcher, but today I also handle a business. Mm-hmm. Now I can approach numbers by saying, "Oh my God." The other thing is to say, "I need to do this. Let me do it in the most happy way." Right, I must get interested in these numbers, and I think numbers tell you a story. I travel a lot. I can say, "Oh man, another morning flight," but I have said I love airports. I love to watch people at airports, right? So I don't start with "Am I interested or not?" Whatever needs to be done, I must get interested in it, right? And and like I said, I think it it uh, it keep, make keeps me a very happy person, you know. And uh, and and because of my childhood, which I hated when I was yeah. a child, because you know you were all constantly like you make friends and then you know you have to let go. You make friends, you have to go to a new environment and so on. But uh, today I find that whoever, whoever in this room, I'll have a connect with them, mm. right? Because it may be because of where I belong, or I've studied there, or you, travel, you know, I, I, have, I have yeah. been there, yeah. right? Like so, we recently went to Kashmir, and I have lived uh, some part of my life in Srinagar, and everybody there knew I had lived in Srinagar because I told them, of sure. course. And uh, but they were all like, "Oh my god!" They were willing to do anything for me, you know. Mm. So wherever Siliguri, have you lived in Siliguri? I would. I've lived in Siliguri, right? Like. Tenga Valley, like, you know, these obscure places in Arunachal and, you know, Himachal and all of that. So, so I think I'm able to, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a nice segue into, uh, into a, th- uh, into thawing a relationship. Yeah. yeah sure. So, yeah. So sure. I, I do believe today that I'm so glad I was an army child, you know, because I don't think this can come by learning, right? Mm, like it no. is just by living. You know, so yeah, I think that's fundamentally what makes me who I am. Also, because I belong to the army, uh, discipline is in me, right? Like uh, my my dad, like if you have to leave at seven, if it's seven one, he leave you and go, right? Wow. Like so, uh, seven o'clock means seven o'clock. Uh, you know, there are there is a schedule, there is time for everything. Also, like commitment to what you have promised. I think these are all things that. That have been ingrained in me since I was a child. So a lot of things come quite easy to me, mm-hmm. like to be committed to a routine, to be disciplined. All of that is uh, not difficult. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no. It, it's it's a, it's like uh, there are so many neurons firing in terms of uh, what would be the best way to encapsulate value uh, from whatever you said. Number one, traveling a lot as a kid. I've met both sides of the spectrum. It has had a debilitating effect on some kids and uh, because it's unfamiliar and, you know, adaptability is questionable. And there are some other kids like yourself who like thrived on that, learned and, you know, uh, made some sense out of complexity. The second thing that you spoke about, and this is something that I feel very strongly about, find your passion. Right, and it's it's a glib phrase. It's it sounds nice. It you know it, it it rolls off easily on your tongue. But there is a a certain amount of romance, a certain amount of responsibility when you take it upon yourself to love what you're doing right now, in the process and commit to it. And I think that's really really nice what you just said about I don't have to love everything for me to do it. When I start doing it, hopefully, I will get and build a stronger relationship with whatever I'm doing. Yes, that would be correct. Right? Yes. That's a very refreshing old world attitude, I must say. <laughs> Is it though? <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Think about it. From the prism of a Gen Alpha or a Gen Z, because, um, you know, we, we are from a different generation in that sense. But if you were to talk to consumers today or professionals today, uh, it is what makes my heart sink today. It could be this. I have access to it. And hence, I will get into that space. This idea of like sticking at something that you don't like so that you see better results. Is it that strong today? Yeah, but I, I don't think I ever said that I stuck at something I don't like. 
Sure. Right. Like uh, basically likability is not a filter for me. Mm. Right. It is what needs to get done. And uh, fundamentally what I do as uh, like, like, you know, what I told you earlier is something I love. Of course. I cannot course. imagine, uh, you know, uh, because I think, I think the other thing, like, um, I've been constantly thinking about this, that, you know, I've been here 25 years, you know, you get offers, like yeah. various offers, but you know, and, and there are many people like me in my organization. I think that makes quantum very special as well. Um, and I keep wondering, like, you know, why have I stayed, right? One of the things is that, uh, we, we work across categories, right? Mm. Like we work with very different kinds of clients and I think, on the one hand, I'm, I do everything with interest. On the other hand, I also go, get bored very easily. Mm. Right. So, but when I'm, if I'm working on some tech thing in the morning and I'm working on soaps in the afternoon or, um, you know, Atta in the evening, I mean, that's, that's really what keeps me going, right? Like, because you're engaging with different kinds of minds in terms of how they're interacting with different kinds of brands or categories or whatever. So I love it, Anju. My question is for people who lose their mojo because they're doing the same thing for a long time. Right. Uh, very few professionals are lucky to get to delve and solve different problems. Yes. Because inherently, I think we are problem solving machines, right? In that sense, we like putting things together. We like making sense of things like that. We like removing the hood and seeing what's going underneath. How can I add value? Uh, that's very much a part of, you know, being, you know, a part of, of the planet at, at this point in time. Uh, this toss up between novelty and sticking to something not because you need to like it. That's an interesting phase for a professional, right? Yeah, so, but I like it is what I'm saying. You, you do, know, yeah. you do. But a lot of, but a lot yeah. of, uh, but a lot of uh, 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 leaders out there, I'm very sorry to say they're stuck in a warp, I, in, a, in a very painful creation of hell uh, of their own and sometimes they don't see an out. You know, but I have a take on that. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. I, I feel actually, if you look at the work world and yeah, I'm sure yeah, yeah. you, you know, you in your capacity yeah. as a coach, uh, you know that yeah. better. But I do find that most people at work are quite unhappy. Right. Like, so you, th so there is this idea of work life balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which to me is the fundamental reason for unhappiness at work. Lovely. Right. Because what it does is that it, distinguishes work from life beautiful work is such an integral part of life right yeah, like it yeah. it gives you your identity when i ask you what you do you'll define yourself yeah. as an executive yeah. coach right yeah. you won't yeah. say uh you i'm know, a father of two sometimes but <laughs> yeah, yeah but like maybe that'll come <laughs> later it. No, right? no, like I hear you. it 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 helps you holiday yeah. it helps you buy nice clothes 200%. it helps you you know it it helps you do so many things however the term work life balance separates work from life, hmm. right? And that to me is the fundamental problem, I, right? I agree. So now, so having placed that societal problem, sure. uh, as a result, I really think that work is integral to identity. The other big problem is parenting. Hmm. And I'll tell you why, right? Like parents, when they go out to work, feel guilty hmm. that they have not spent time with their children. So when, when parents come back, from work, uh, the, uh, like, oh, I'm so tired. Although you may have had a blast, right? Sure, you may sure, have sure. like done some yeah, amazing yeah. kick-ass yeah. work, but you come home and you're like, oh my God, like it was so tough and all of that. That's what you're imprinting your children with, mm. right? So when children go into the workforce, they're like, yeah, I must be unhappy here, you know, because like the good things are going to happen uh, outside after seven, mm. right? Like, or after yeah. whatever, oh, my work sucks and I'm, you know, that that's what we've, that's what we have constructed. So, actually, all people who are unhappy with work, I'm sorry to say, politically very incorrect, their parents are to blame. Oh, wow. And I do okay. think that… Uh, this is Freudian all the way. <laughs> and I do think work-life balance as a term must go now, you know, because work is part of life. And wh and who, why would you want to be unhappy eight hours of your day? 200%. Why? 200%. You know, you're, you're choosing that. Because you know what? Life is going to happen like after… Whatever this is. I think there is a sense of let's let me pay this piper his due so that the end is uh, worth the destination is worth it. And the destination has different meaning and purpose for different people. Absolutely. Right? A better education for my kids, putting bread on the table and whatever. This is the wage that I need to yes. pay. Uh, but things are changing now. There are deeper questions being asked. And for me, the coin really dropped. The penny dropped when uh, I heard Richard Branson say, uh, what is work? What is play? It is all life at the end of the day. Yeah. It's, it's together. Absolutely. It's never like a, like a construct in the middle saying that, 
okay this is where you work yeah. and this is where you, you have live. life this is where you live right <laughs> oh my god yeah. like okay now let me go out and breathe because yeah. you know i am in yeah. living now okay? yeah. it's it's yeah. it's idiotic also i'm saying you're investing so much time here oh, and you're creating this unhappiness for yourself it's a little ridiculous don't right. you think right you know but uh what happens to mojo now mojo we wish that all of us had in inex- inexhaustible supply of mojo to to be up there and do things that we love and uh, do it all the time uh but we all hit low points when there is less gas in the tank yes right uh what is your personal tryst with low mojo and how have you got out of it so yeah so everybody has periods Absolutely. of i'm guessing low mojo means low energy and yeah, yeah. That, low that low energy low engagement low yeah, yeah, yeah. um the joie de vivre the joy of life at work right um it happens yeah of course um how did you manage to work your way through it okay so i think travel right mm. like take a break you know like uh, uh, you know like i really hate uh, sorry uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a strong word probably but this whole idea of busyness is something mm. i do not like mm. right like when people say oh i'm so busy i'm so busy i just i just feel like if you especially as senior professionals you've spent so many years in any industry yeah. you're in surely you must have figured out a way <laughs> to be less busy to be able to uh, you know own your time more uh, right. uh, you know in a better way so i i do i i despise the idea of busyness right like i i really think that abundance of time is the largest uh, biggest gift you can give right like attention and time are probably absolutely very, absolutely uh, you know it, it is the biggest gift right so um, take a break i think that's one the other at least for me mm-hmm. uh, I, at the cost of sounding like a nerd is read right like Beautiful. and i think i think to be able to read you know the third is um have have friends who and i don't mean acquaintances right like i mean friends Amazing. if you're in a low space speak to people who love you you know who know you who, who know you well went i mean because you're human i'm a leader which means you know no, i cannot have no. any emotions i no. cannot yeah. uh, express yeah. uh, sadness or yeah. uh, irritation or whatever it's unreal you're human speak to people who you love who understand you express it right like i think i think very simple things eat good food eat japanese food you know <laughs> <laughs> oh my god this is like uh, on, on a scale of relevant uh, relatability this is just hitting it off the park uh talk about all the stuff right travel absolutely uh, a way to uh, look at things from a different perspective to switch off unplug uh have other experiences that you can you know connect back to your work at some point in time and some of the best ideas that we get is when we're not working and your subconscious does the trick and you probably find an answer to a niggling uh, problem uh second is i love it read i it does if that's nerdiness uh, grade a nerd <laughs> um i've always noticed that when i'm stuck and when i start reading it helps me go to another part within my heart within my head and access that space it's a safe space and i love that space of uh, imbuing myself with somebody else's thoughts and figuring out what it means it's a beautiful space to be in and the third one i really really can't tell you how relevant it is today uh being alone in a madding crowd uh in urban i i i don't know if you've done any study or the agency has done any study about urban alienation right loneliness loneliness, loneliness yeah. right um it's rampant of course it's huge so in the hustle bustle in the business as you call it there isn't space to make real deep nurturing connections and social media has kind of winged it and come and said hey listen i can do that for you let me get you xyz likes and you know you get accepted you get validated by the tribe but uh, to surround yourself with well meaning people in today's time is a luxury and it's a beautiful thing to uh, work towards and you know i think that's why when i think of quantum versus other organizations like i said i'm not the only one who spent 25 years here sure there are many people like me right which is so special for an organization what's in the water there that's what i'm saying <laughs> it is the deep connections so we all friends 
we love to hang out with each other Beautiful. you know we we know everything about everybody's everything and like actually <clears throat> it's all credit to my, the founders right like and that's that's the kind of culture they've created so so we don't want to not hang out with each other mm. you know and we oh, don't we don't want to not create beautiful. with each other right yeah. like so so i think that's the that's what makes my company special that you you it allows you to create deeper bonds it allows you to say oh man i hate this or oh man i love it and i love you and i don't like you and whatever you know you can you can just say these things and and everybody is completely okay with it i th- i think uh, uh, at a personal level i can't agree more because uh, in the places that i work i used to go to meet friends and i incidentally used to work but my colleagues were my friends and they still continue to be uh, to this day and the second thing is obviously there's a huge tome of psychological research about happiness at work and it says uh, make make a friend at work at least one but if you have a well meaning set of friends at the place that you work amazing it it just doesn't get better than that absolutely and that's why you know in covid right mm. like that was the problem yeah because you cannot make friends online yeah. you know yeah. Uh, right yeah. like so i i i i uh, recall like we got new business uh, during covid uh, and you know those were transactions so you did the project sure. and sure. whatever but after covid when you actually went and met them met your clients met your new clients or your colleagues that's when you created relationships gotcha right like gotcha. because because the energy exchange is so critical to uh, any kind of relationship 200% that you create, yeah. absolutely absolutely um What is unique about your personal brand as a leader? <laughs> I I don't know. <laughs> Quite frankly, like let's go you know, for what it. Let's does, go what does that a, even mean, right? What like, it means is okay. I'll I'll okay. Let me prime you a little. Uh, if you key in leadership models, there are like twenty thousand different models of leadership. You know, and we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And what was content? What was uh, what made meaning in the eighties didn't make meaning in the nineties. Just like life, right? There's evolution of thought, evolution in civil society, evolution in leadership practices, right? So, you know, for lack of a better word, you have charismatic leadership, you have authentic leadership, you have servant leadership, you have Jack Welch in leadership, you have Steve Jobs, you have Satya Nadella kind of leadership, you have Steve Ballmer kind of leadership, and you know, you have Richard Branson on one side. you have jeff bezos on the other you know so on and so <laughs> forth right so with all of this um just like how you're saying hey listen this is the kind of an individual i think i am uh you would be able to say this is the kind of leader i think i am okay and at, at best it is i think because yeah. the world gets a say in that conversation Absolutely. right um, yeah. what 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 do you think would be the way you come across as a leader and you know so i'm going to attempt to answer this please go uh because i think others would be uh, like you know they'd be able to articulate this better Absolutely. i feel like uh, there are there are certain uh, i think like fundamentally i lead mm-hmm. by example so if i want you to deliver on time i will make sure i deliver on oh. time right so so that's that's one the other is i do not work on weekends and mm. i do not want you to work on weekends you know and i do not want you to work after 6 o'clock or w- w- whatever else right so so one is really leading by examples i think the other is there are certain guardrails that we are not going to mess with and there's great clarity on that right like dishonesty um, you know unethical practices that is not going to happen everybody is very clear i think as a leader i also so i feel i feel sure sure yeah, sure. Sure, sure that i give people space god gotcha. right like so if i have i so okay i start with trust mm, right gotcha. so i don't i don't start with Lovely. Uh, okay you prove it to me gotcha. I, you know if i have hired you if you're part of my company here it is now you will have to uh, uh, you will have to disprove me that you're beautiful. not worthy of being trusted trusted right and i think that that like takes away a lot of it my does. it's convenient it, it for does. me as well it right it does and uh, and in fact more often than not human beings will not let you down mm. everybody is there to do great work right so uh, so so to trust people and i think uh, i feel again i think i'll always have you back mm. right like if you're in my team i will make sure that like outside i will have your back uh, the other is really like i think i'm very committed to feedback mm. you know and like if you give me feedback i'm very open to feedback and i i believe that that's the only way to evolve and if somebody asks me for feedback i will make sure i'm completely honest because again i believe that you're asking because you genuinely want to know and it is not because you want like you a want nice hear, warm feeling yeah you want to hear <laughs> nice things so i i will i will make sure of that uh, that as well and i do think that one must have fun 
jaw lovely you know so uh, so you know laughing yeah. fooling around yeah. all of that i think is very important as well no so, 100% yeah. i yeah. think uh, humor is a very very underrated leadership attribute yeah that's true uh you know i used to joke at you know some some clients place that i'd gone uh at the executive floor i said i said people walk around on this floor like they have a cactus lobbed up their backside <laughs> is that like a is that like a prerequisite to get to this executive <laughs> floor you know and yeah. you know everybody had a good laugh but i said really i mean you guys should loosen up a bit you know this is this is also a place where you forge connections yes. and connections are not forged when nobody's smiling yeah. and that's not a good yeah. uh, scene yeah, yeah but uh, sorry just just one more thing i think also that you know different situations require you to re- respond differently of course. so this is my style of leadership that's why it, ma- it makes me a little uncomfortable no no this is right? by and, and so large you, you this know, is uh-huh. like by and large yeah. on an average sure, sure. you know it's not like when it's a sunny day or when it's a rainy day on yeah. a regular day yeah. more often than not yeah. right yeah. uh what would you what would your sense of personal identity be about the leadership behaviors that you bring to the workplace right, right? so have and, i answered oh, beautiful okay cool. you know no no uh, you know i would have pushed you a little bit more for metaphors uh, but we'll save that for uh, a later date uh, obviously coming from a very biased point of view uh, but here goes i think one of the fundamental things that great leaders do is they're outstanding at influencing people and one of the key tenets to influencing people would uh, be i believe storytelling to be able to be a good storyteller is no longer a nice to have thing for a cxo but it's increasingly becoming a must have skill thoughts you know uh, stories i don't think it's limited to cxos mm-hmm. uh, it is for everyone beautiful right like uh, i i do believe stories make the world not atoms right like so uh, i mean uh, look at us as human beings uh, you know if you think like in uh, in the stone age and all of that everybody got together around a campfire what did you exchange you exchange stories right like because stories create bonds stories uh, convey values stories uh, define culture stories define behavior all of it right so i think storytelling is a is a skill that all human beings must have Beautiful. and uh, you know and and i think it's important to sort of articulate what business are you in mm. right like all of us as human beings fundamentally are in the business of persuasion right we are all attempting to persuade yep. someone or the other like he's attempting to get the mic closer to me sure. right you you're attempting sure. to yeah. you know get something yeah. from me yeah. i'm attempting yeah. to you know we're all attempting to persuade someone or the other right and so how do you persuade and persuasion is not coercion oh absolutely right like they're, they're very absolutely. different yeah you persuade through stories mm. so it is uh, to me storytelling makes us who we are storytelling makes us human and makes us the social being that we are so i'm not sure it is special to cx not at all not at all yeah it is uh, it is a skill that all human Everybody, beings have yeah. and some have it uh, better like don or uh, sure, justin because sure. they are in the business sure. but i think all of us are storytellers no 200% i think uh, the you know if you were to get to the bottom of it there's a there's a whole talk about tribalism right we are tribal by nature and it's found resonance in various fields of thinking when we say vasudeva kutumbakam the whole world is a family and when we meet members of the family we talk about what pains us what what dreams we have what fe- what are the fears we carry and so on and so forth and if they're not great stories what are what, what are they and also one of the most potent forms of influence in that sense would be the birth of religions around the world and uh, what religion doesn't have stories absolutely right absolutely and um i still remember you know from i think probably one of the best metaphors that i've heard uh is jesus when he said when he told peter if i'm not mistaken go forth and be fishers of men and because peter i think was a fisherman and uh, such a beautiful turn of phrase to convey complex thought in beautiful sentences and to capture your heart along with your head um i think from time immemorial that's been planted uh, within us and i believe very strongly that all of us have stories all of us are interesting people 
but it's also equally important to be interested in someone else's story. I I fully fully agree. In fact, uh, you know, I had read something about uh, poetry, but mm-hmm. I think it's true for stories as well. And uh, what it what what it said about poetry was poetry's highest task is to awaken with means other than shock. Wow. You know, and I think that's what stories do as well, right? Like because they give you a sense of new possibility, right? Like they give you a sense of what can be, right? And they they help you to also make meaning. or what is you know and uh, so i think uh, they are journeys of awakening and uh, you know to bring the context back to the workplace because fundamentally that's what i do i work with senior leaders um it becomes a little bit of a tough ask when they say jay that's easy for you to do you're an executive coach i deal in numbers and i press in numbers and uh you know uh, it takes a little bit of nudge to tell them that stories are nothing it's it's data but it has a soul stories are nothing but data with a soul um but i think the world and especially the business world um there is a lot of humanism that that always existed but it is coming to the fore when it comes to thinking about hard sciences uh your your take your thoughts Yeah you know see um I want to recommend a book to you uh-huh. which is called Figuring okay. and it is by this most incredible author called Maria Popova mm-hmm. who she runs a blog as well called the Marginalian Marginalian and uh, you know so so she's this book is about the greats the great scientists like you know Kepler and Rachel Carson and uh, you know the great poets and the artists and one of the fundamental things that she talks about is that science and artistry are not not different like you see the romance i mean like the scientist sees the beauty yeah, in what what they're creating so and linked to that the book also says that why do we why did scientists pursue to unravel mysteries of the universe there is romance because <laughs> it's they're beautiful yeah. right like so it was the pursuit of beauty that made you study them Right, like and beauty, not in a not as a physical not fact, as a, yeah, and not uh, as, not the way a poet would probably look at it, but beauty nevertheless. A beauty as a performance of being, right? Like beauty as uh, truth, you know, beauty as uh, discovery. That's why people went after all of this. So I, I see again. I feel like these compartments are no, are very very artificial, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's like work life, you yeah. know. Yeah, it is like yeah. okay, so if you're a scientist, then you cannot tell stories, Absolutely. right? Or if you're a stand up comic, you cannot. You be can't serious. be serious. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's just these and are. We know from our experience, more often than not, that happens to be the case. I met a lot of stand up comics who are otherwise very very serious, serious observers of the human condition. and scientists who are goofy and funny and you know uh, uh you know in their in their regular uh environment but think about like why does something sound funny because ah. it resonates right like yeah. it makes you laugh because there's some truth yeah. in it yeah. so actually to, to me stand up comics are such narrators of what's going on 200% right like and 200%. they're such narrators of insight i mean they are ami- i'm blown not same here I'm Completely. blown, and the, the the term I'd used earlier, vuja de, they can just look at something so familiar yeah. and create like a completely new twist on it, 200%. right? Like so, yeah. You know, coming back to your point about why these are not uh, very very different, I remember reading a book called The Tower of Physics, and uh, Robert Oppenheimer talking about number one, the explosion uh, at uh, at Hiroshima. or uh, the first atomic bomb and he described it to the, to the blaze of a thousand suns which is surya koti sahasra koti samaprabha yes. which is you know from the gita and he also describes the dance of the proton around the nucleus uh to the tandavan ratya and i'm like i know like oh, disparate fields of thought disparate fields of thinking and then there is somebody who is trying to connect the two dots and, you know let uh, me tell you something really interesting so i think in the in the late 19th century and the early 20th century poets used to attend science conventions wow you know because to draw metaphors so when you think of the idea of celestial beauty the the you know oh. celestial beauty is yeah, yeah, celestial yeah, yeah. is scientific yeah, yeah. you've brought it into the realm of poetry right so uh, i mean these divorces uh are actually completely man made sure. people who are who are creating don't see these divisions which is why they able to create beautiful 
Yeah. Interesting. Um, so I work with a lot of uh, senior leaders uh, who are poised for the world stage. Huh. In their organization, another organization, they're all looking at global responsibilities at this point in time. And they all reach out to me for some aspects. But I don't want to prime you. <laughs> if you have to think about, uh, I, I firmly believe that this is not just India's year, that, but this is India's century. It's a great time. Uh, uh, lots of promise, lots of potential. There is opportunity in the air kind of a thing. But for us to really be world beaters, I mean, it's, it's a very warrior kind of a term, but so be it. What do you think we should get better at? Huh. So I, uh, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with the term world beaters yes. because as quantum, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think we, we are trying to beat anyone, mm. right? Like the, the philosophy is about excellence. Mm. So how do you become excellent at what you do? Sure. And therefore it's a, it's an ongoing pursuit Got it. because if you're beating someone yeah. means your worth is only dependent on the on the, in, on the, on other, the incumbent on this, number one at that time. Uh, and yeah. yeah, the relative, yeah. it is a relative yeah. scale. It right? is relative. Yeah. Now, um, so as Indians, I, I think that, uh, I mean, there's this, uh, there's this politi- polit- political scientist mm-hmm. called Joseph Nye, mm-hmm. who talks about this whole idea of soft power, uh-huh. right? And he says that earlier power was about domination. So if you think, uh, think about the world, uh, world, uh, earlier it was USA, yeah. USSR, yeah. right? Like yeah. they were, yeah. and yeah. They, they, they dominated because of the brute force oh, and power of money, uh, that they had. However, the idea of soft power, and he says that's the future of power, is a a world where you're powerful because you're magnetic, right? Like so. uh, So persuasion instead of coercion. Yeah, and you're 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 magnetic because of your inherent qualities. Now let's look at India. It's uh, and then Shashi Tharoor actually has talked about this idea of soft power, and if you look at India, it is so magnetic. It's it magical. It it's is. got culture. It it's got beauty. It's got the hills and the deserts and the mountains. And and we as a people are the most populous uh, people sure, in the world. Sure. As a result, we're really competitive. Yeah. Right? Like, and, uh, you know, we want to beat each other, beca- win. We want to win because that's the strategy for survival. Sure, right? Like, sure, it's not It's sure. not because, you know, you want to it's talk. Not, yeah, right? Like yeah, you, yeah. You, you need to do that yeah, uh, yeah. to be able to win. So actually, you have all the makings to be uh, to to have supremacy in the world, right? Like, but I think like a couple of things that probably mm-hmm, hold us mm-hmm. back. One, I feel is I'm not sure we are over the colonial hangover yet. Mm. So I don't know if we are as proud of ourselves mm. as we should be. You know, so so that I think is one uh, one space Beautiful. to think about. I think the other is uh, this whole thing of marketing. Mm. You know, like like for I don't know if you've seen this recent film called Air. Of course. Yeah. So Air, uh, and this is like a friend pointed this out, and he articulated it really beautifully. He said, actually, if you think of Air, it is one conversation. It is. It is actually it, just it one is, conversation, yes, absolutely. right? Absolutely. And you've made a movie on it, right? <laughs> or like even like sport films. Yeah, and yeah, again, yeah. I'm borrowing. 100%. I'm borrowing from this friend, but like he he keeps talking about why can't Indians make great sport films, right? Like I mean, all the amazing sport films are made abroad. So I think I. Think I think this this whole thing of marketing mm. is is another gap. I think the third gap again, uh, not because of anything else. It's just because of limited means and very many people. Is I'm not sure we spend enough time articulating the right question. Mm. So we're focused on solving, right? Like so, you dive in and you solve. However, the right question is so critical, and uh, you know. Albert Einstein, this quote is attributed to Albert Einstein. I'm not but, sure he yeah. said it. Uh, but basically he said, if, I've, if I'm given one. one hour to solve a problem, I'll spend 55 minutes articulating the right question. I'm not sure Indians are fundamentally trained to articulate the right question. Mm. So if you were to do that, uh, I do believe that uh, there's, there's nothing, nothing stopping us. So I, I think these three things. Amazing. So, uh, with your permission, I'd like to add a couple more. Uh, certainly, of <laughs> course, you would know better. <laughs> yeah. um, our, uh, th- there is this uh, idea of being passive-aggressive, uh, thanks to years of conditioning and the cultural milieu that we were born in and we were set in, our ability to say no, our ability to fall in step and conform is a little higher. 
and sometimes for a new idea, for a new innovation, for uh, a new thought process to happen, your ability to, ability to say no is, is fairly important, number one. Um, number two uh, also dovetails into uh, this idea of marketing, this idea of communicating a better story um, and driving a stake in the ground and uh, standing your ground. Sometimes, uh, I, I don't know whether to attribute that to colonial hangover, there is a, there is a sense of still kowtowing to a second world order instead of claiming our place in the sun, if not now, in the days to come. I think there is a little bit of a mismatch there, but that apart, I think, uh, because there are a lot of things that come easily uh, to us, because we are a country of, you know, what what we are with uh, the most populous and being competitive, uh, ability to think out of the box, being comfortable with ambiguity. These are emerging to be very, very critical uh, business leadership skills that uh, globally leaders need to be able to pivot, to shape shift, to think in the moment, to, you know, find solutions. I think that is something that we already bring to the table. But if we do the rest of it, I think it'll be like smoothening the corners kind of a thing. That's, that's great. All right. Um, in this assault on deep work that afflicts all of us, what are your hacks that you can pass on to our viewers? I think, uh, I think I love this question. And, uh, you know, I do believe that whatever you do, mm -hmm. Uh, for it to um, for it to be successful, it must be anchored in in a philosophy or a belief, right? Like so. Um, so the idea, I think, your question is on productivity, yeah. right? Like, how do you stay yeah. productive? I think the idea of productivity to me is anchored in the idea of time and energy, mm -hmm. and uh, I do believe that uh, managing time is equal to managing energy, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. in my business. If I were to look at the smallest unit that I sell, right? Like because we don't have products yeah, to sell yeah. or we don't, it is time. I charge for my time, right? Like or, uh, you know, I charge for the consumer's time or sure. whatever. Time is the smallest unit and therefore it's critical. And uh, I have some, some beliefs in that space. One is really the fact that you make more time if you respect other people's time, mm. right? Like so it's not about your work. But if you're committed to the other and uh, and you start there, as opposed to your work, I think in the bargain, you make more time for everyone. So committing to the other person's time is one, one of my biggest productivity hacks. Beautiful. Right? Like uh, the other is really uh, what I call hug the shit. Mm -hmm. Right? Like so we all have things that we are not very interested in and there are then things that we're very excited by. I do believe that when you, when you, and you keep postponing yeah. what you don't want to do, right? And what that does is it drains energy, which means whatever you're interested in or whatever you're doing, that takes longer. Oh. So if you just do what you're not interested in, if you don't postpone it, if you just finish it earlier, then actually it, it produces more time. The third is breaks. You know, I think uh, taking breaks, we all think that, oh, I don't have time, so let me just power through. Actually, you're being extremely unproductive. Mm -hmm. That break will give you that one idea that is going to solve everything and, you know, all of that. So take regular breaks is is the other productivity hack. I think also, like I said earlier, busyness. You know, busyness is not equal to importance, quite frankly. Just because you're busy doesn't mean you're important. Gotcha. So please, let's get down from the high horse of, horse of busyness. And I have recently added one more, which is what I call crevices of time. Mm. You know, and very often what happens is there's a lot of time leakage, right? Like, so meetings get postponed, things get cancelled. What do you do with that time? Right? So there is a window of time. What are you doing in that time? We actually just let it leak. Mm. Most people. Beautiful. What What I do is that I look at that time and I say, oh, is there something I need to do tomorrow that I can do today? Is there some reading that's pending? Is there a is there a talk I I should have I need to watch? Should I watch it here? So crevices of time, I think, is my other very big productivity hack. No, I think, uh, yeah. And then the other very important one, I don't know how I forgot that, is plan, 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 and then do. Have a plan. 
most often we just think oh, crisis okay now let me just start doing it. it and you're 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 praying for magic to happen i'd work the other way i spend like if i if you were to take a task that is 100 i spend 75 of that 100 planning and then 25 doing right because if you have a great plan you don't need much time to execute so these are some of my productivity hacks fantastic <clears throat> what about the age of distraction what yeah. about uh, social media what about uh, email pings what about all the yeah. Yeah, like i i keep saying paul allen you know productivity guru says meditate by all, by all means meditate but remember to first feed the cat you know <laughs> uh, it yeah. keeps mewling around and uh, so all the things that bombard us there's like tons of information that yes. attacks us from various yeah. points is there a hack that you have um to make sure that you're you're left unsullied or sullied as little as possible by all these pings yeah you know <laughs> you know i feel i feel you should surrender again i do believe that this whole compartmentalization mm-hmm, of time mm-hmm. i think is is energy draining i'm curious about that email but i will say no i have to do deep work ah. right i'm saying check that email mm. get back to it you know get uh, uh, so so like for instance some of the things i do is in the morning uh, you know when i wake up i check mm. my email and my whatsapp okay like i check it done then till the time i'm not ready i do not go back to my phone gotcha. and that's one period of time where i'm not dealing with any kind of tech so i'm with nature you know working out whatever i'm doing all of that uh, you know reading the newspaper i sure. you know i'm doing those sure. things and then i get back and then quite frankly because my job involves a lot of people right and because my decision or what i say has an impact on others yes. i must check my email mm. you know no, and course. i must of course i must be doing my work uh, along with it of and course. i think i have i have been able to build it as a skill mm. so i will if you write to me and i you must have noticed if you write to me you, you will get an mm. instant response unless i am in a meeting Got right it. like where then i must be completely committed to that meeting so yeah i i mean <laughs> you know it's like like my daughter would say my gen z daughter it's not that big a deal you know <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, no, it's not it, that no, serious, it's interesting you because know? <laughs> uh, you know uh, i had a boss who says and 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 i think there was some merit in what he said as well um i'm accessible to you but i might not be available all the time hmm. which means uh you can't barge in you know when i'm focused on some deep work you can't just barge in so there are pockets of time in a day of course when there is fire all hands on deck the whistle blows everybody jumps puts out the fire and whatever but otherwise there are times in a day that you can walk in but i would prefer that to be a little more predictable so that i am at my best and i function at my best like i said you know different strokes for different absolutely. folks kind of a thing but absolutely but i you know i'm curious to know so what is the opposite of deep work what is what is shallow work what does that mean if it's no. shallow please don't do it you know no, so so it's yeah. like uh, no no so it, it uh, <clears throat> i wish life was that simple no. <laughs> so there is there is urgent and important there is just important there's urgent urgent and important there are like two by two kind of a matrix so the urgent and important unfortunately also happens to be the ugliest frog in the tray of frogs that you need to eat like brian stracy tracy says and you also said do the most important bit the hard bit so that you have more energy left for the things that you really love and that's a that's a great uh, this thing the macabre equivalent for that is just w- w- what i just uh, shared if you have a bowl of frogs eat the ugliest one first um so that give shallow work will will be fleeting will be without due investment but it's something that needs to get done so we all bring different level of rigor into what we do is that fair is that a fair observation well i i'm not sure mm. i i feel like you give it what it needs mm. right like if something if it's uh, if it's a if it's a decision about where to go for dinner yeah don't you give, give it, it that yeah. kind of attention Absolutely. versus Absolutely. something else that is probably uh, no, you know no that's spoken that's spoken like somebody who's who's at the summit uh, <laughs> like i keep joking <laughs> you will not believe it I, i i can tell you these are very basic uh but still people struggle with it okay oh, i'll give an example of a great hack uh that somebody shared in a group coaching conversation i like you know you make a lot of decisions a day 
and we all know decisions deplete us you know our glucose levels drops because the brain is trying to say what decision do i make based on the information that i have and uh, so she said i've decided we are a family of three people uh, and we have different dietary preferences but what i've done is i figured out for one month everything is set i don't have to go back every day and reengineer what somebody wants it's all set that's one critical thing because it's family well being nutrition and all of that but i've said okay i've done this at one shot that's over and she said you can't believe as a single mother that's freed up so much of my energy lessened my guilt and made me more efficient at work and i found that was an interesting way to approach uh, that and like you said right low involvement decisions and high involvement decisions but um you'll be amazed at how many people miss the trees for the woods no absolutely i feel again like it's a it's a fundamental human uh, need i mean as soon as you're born that's that's what uh, we all want control mm. right and and uh, like i think the opposite of it is empowerment mm. right like so so for instance it just taking off from the the lady's yeah, example yeah, yeah. of the menu and yeah. you know probably yeah. her circumstances are different yeah. i'm i'm lucky to have A, a, a girl who lives in my house mm-hmm. right and uh, i've empowered her mm. all menu decisions Beautiful. are hers there I don't, you go i don't need to make yeah. all decisions is yeah. something i'm very clear on Amazing. right like so so when like uh, people uh, people come and ask me things sometimes it's like can you make this decision yourself amazing so like exactly you know it's the cross of the leader mm. right like what all do you need to control and that's a choice you make you know you you know you know what i'm saying you don't have to do everything there is this idea of collaboration there is this idea that there are more intelligent minds Hive than you mind. that are yeah, together yeah, yeah. right and so if they are there then i i i constantly i'm constantly trying to cut the what's the word not the umbilical cord but no no yeah. cut the uh, the the flap right mm. like the let's let's so do two people need to be involved god gotcha. right like i mean if one person and that's not me can sure, do it sure. or quite frankly it saves yeah. me like yeah. you know a lot of time so <laughs> nice i think I, th- i think it's a nice uh, segue when he said uh, it is the leader's cross to bear but once in a while the leader needs to step off the cross somebody needs the wood <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> anju thank you so much it's been a blast <laughs> thank you jay i had a blast too i learned some things about myself and uh, yeah i hope it's been useful this is what you wanted i don't know <laughs> i learned a new word <laughs> which is breviloquent <laughs> i'm going to use that i'm not sure if i'm capable of utilizing using that adjective but i i learned something thank you so much you're welcome